Can you hear me okay? It's, it's an honor and a privilege to address um, this part of the Kurdish free, freedom movement um, and whose members face risks every day and suffer consequences every day that I can't possibly imagine that are nothing like I face at home. I wish for the success, not only for the success of your movement, but for your own personal safety. Thank you. So, in February 1999, at the moment when Abdullah Öcalan was abducted in Kenya, Murray Bookchin was living with me in Burlington, Vermont. We watched Öcalan's capture on the news reports on television. Murray sympathized with the plights of the Kurds. He said so whenever the subject came up. But he saw Mr. Öcalan as yet another Marxist-Leninist guerrilla leader, a latter-day Stalinist. Murray had been criticizing such people as an anarchist for decades, for misleading people's impulses toward freedom into authority, dogma, statism, and even, all appearances to the contrary, acceptance of capitalism. He, but he knew Marxist-Leninists well. Bookchin himself had been a Stalinist back in the 1930s as a young teenager in New York. He left the communists late in the decade and joined the Trotskyists. At the time, around 1940, the Trotskyists had thought the coming World War II was going to end in proletarian socialist revolutions in Europe and the United States. They were sure it would. The way World War I, for example, had given rise to the Russian Revolution. So surely the same thing would happen at the end of the Second World War. During that war, young Bookchin worked hard in a foundry to try to organize the workers to build the movement, to rise up and make that revolution. But in 1945, the workers did not make the revolution, of course. Um, the Trotskyist movement, which had made this firm prediction, found itself, it, 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 the, the prediction was unfulfilled, so it collapsed, at least in the United States. Many of its members, probably most of them, gave up on Marxism and revolutionary politics generally and decided to become academics or at, edit magazines or in other ways go work within the mainstream as social democrats very often. Murray Bookchin too gave up on Marxism because the proletariat had not fulfilled its role. It had not turned out to be revolutionary. But instead of going mainstream, he and a few of his friends did something unusual. They decided to remain social revolutionaries. They recalled that back in 1940, Trotsky, before his assassination, had said that should the unthinkable happen, should the war, the coming war, not end in revolution, then it would be necessary for them to rethink revolutionary doctrine, to rethink Marxist doctrine itself. Well, since there had been no revolution, Bookchin and his friends got together to try to do what Trotsky had said. They met every week during the 1950s, a little radical group, and looked for ways to renovate the revolutionary project under new circumstances. Capitalism, they remained certain, was an inherently self-destructively flawed system. But if not the proletariat, then what was its weak point? Bookchin realized early in the 50s that its fatal flaw was the fact that it was in conflict with the natural environment, destructive both of nature and of human health. It industrialized agriculture, it tainted crops and, by extension, people with toxic chemicals. It inflated cities to unbearably large megalopolitan size, cut off from nature. It turned people into automatons who damaged both their bodies and their psyches. It pressured them through advertising to spend their money on useless commodities whose production further harmed the environment. The crisis of capitalism, then, would result not from the exploitation of the working class, 
but from the intolerable dehumanization of people and from the destruction of nature. So, to create an alternative, an ecological society, giant cities would have to be decentralized so people could live at a smaller scale and govern themselves and grow food locally and use renewable energy. He's saying this in the 1950s. The new society would be guided not by the dictates of the market or by the imperatives of state authority, but by people's decisions. These decisions would be guided by ethics on a communal scale. <clears throat> to create such a rational ecological society, as he called it, we would need viable institutions, governing institutions, what he called forms of freedom, forms of freedom. Those are the institutions that would bring freedom. Both the revolutionary organization and the institutions in the new society would have to be truly liberatory so that they would not lead to a new Stalin, to yet another tyranny in the name of socialism. And yet, they would have to be strong enough to suppress capitalism. These institutions, he realized, could only be popular democratic assemblies. The present nation state would have to be eliminated and its powers devolved, devolved to people, to citizens and assemblies. They, rather than the masters of industry, could make decisions, for example, about the environment. And since assemblies only work in a locality in order to function at a broader geographical area, as Eirich has explained, they would have to band together to confederate. Murray spent the next decades elaborating these ideas for an ecological democratic society. In the 1980s, for example, he said the confederation of citizens' assemblies would form a counterpower or a dual power to the nation state. And he named this program Libertarian Municipalism, and later using the word communalism. During those decades of the 70s and the 80s, he tried to persuade other American and European leftists about the importance of this, this ecological democratic project. But in, most of, but, in, but in those days, most of them were busy admiring Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, the Sandinistas. Bookchin pointed out that these were dictators, but the mainstream leftists did not want to hear such criticisms. Ecology and democracy are just petty bourgeois ideas, said these leftists. Well, it was, a, it was discouraging, to say the least. The only people who listened to Bookchin at all were the anarchists, because I, his ideas were anti-statist. And so he, he had become, in fact, a, a high-profile anarchist. He told anarchists in Europe and the United States that his program for libertarian municipalism was their natural politics, their obvious revolutionary theory. They would listen to him respectfully, but then they would tell him that they didn't like local government. They didn't like it any more than they liked, than they liked any, uh, any other kind, national government. And they objected to majority voting because they said the minority wouldn't get their way. Majority rule is still rule. They preferred non-political communitarian groups, cooperatives, radical bookstores, communes. Bookchin thought such institutions were excellent. But to make a serious revolution, you need a way to gain active, concrete, vested, structural, legal, political power. Libertarian municipalism was a way to do that, to get this firm toehold against the nation state. He wooed the anarchists with this idea. He courted them. He pleaded with them. He wheedled them. He begged them. He intoned. He scolded them. He did everything to try to persuade them that libertarian municipalism was the best way to make anarchism, popular rule, politically relevant. But by 1999, around the time of Ojalan's arrest, he finally had to admit that he had failed and he was in the process of disengaging from anarchism. With all that going on, we didn't read much about Ojalan's defense at his trial on charges of treason. We didn't know, for example, that he was undergoing a transformation similar to the one Bookchin had undergone half a century earlier. I wish we had read more closely. We would have found out that he was rejecting Marxism-Leninism in favor of democracy that he had concluded that Marxism was authoritarian and dogmatic, 
and unable to creatively approach current problems. We might have read him that he said we must respond to the requirements of the historical moment. He had he told the prosecutors to move forward. He had said it was necessary to reassess principles, the program, and the mode of action. It was like something Bookchin had said in 1946. Again, you know, following Trotsky. Today, Ocalan told his Turkish processors, uh, prosecutors, unknown to us, rigid systems are collapsing, and nat national, cultural, ethnic, religious, linguistic, and indeed regional problems are being solved by granting and applying the broadest democratic standards. The PKK, he said, must give up in its, go its goal of achieving a separate Kurdish state and adopt a democratic program for Turkey as a whole. Democracy, he, ex he said, is key to the Kurdish question because in a democratic system, each citizen has rights and a vote and everyone participates equally regardless of ethnicity. This system would acknowledge the existence of the Kurdish people and their rights to language and culture. It wasn't assembly democracy, this local face-to-face -face democracy such as Bookchin was advocating, but it was a top-down approach at the time initially. The goal, said, wrote Ojalan, is a democratic republic. Whatever the Turkish prosecutors thought of this message, its validity seems obvious to many, but they didn't care for the messenger. They convicted him and sent him finally sent him to prison. Murray Bookchin used to say that the best anarchists are the ones who were formerly Marxists. <laughs> he was a, in fact, he was a connoisseur of the gradations between anarchism and Marxism. So he would have admired Ojalan, I think. They knew how to think, he said. They knew how to draw the logic of ideas. And they understood dialectical philosophy. He would surely have recognized this ability in Ojalan had they met. Both men shared a dialectical cast of mind, inherited from their common Marxist past. Not that they were dialectical materialists anymore. Both understood that that Marxist concept was inadequate because historical causation is not just economic, it's multiple. But both remained dialectical in love with history, in the sense that they were in love with history's developmental processes. Dialectics, as I'm sure you know, is a way of describing change, not kinetic kind of change that is of concern in physics or physical science, but the developmental change that occurs in organic life and in social history. Change, according to dialectics, progresses through contradictions. In any given development, some of the old is preserved, while some of the new is added, resulting in what, Murray, Murray, what Hegel called an Aufhebung in a transcendence, transcendence, which is also called a synthesis in some dialectical contexts. So both men were prone to think in terms of historical development. And both of them wrote sweeping historical accounts of civilization. In fact, more than once, several times, parsing the dialectics of domination and resistance, of states and tyrannies countered by struggles for freedom. Unlike Marxists, they did not use dialectics to predict some inevitable future revolt. They knew dialectics could not predict. Instead, they used it to raise possibilities, to identify potentialities that could be built on for freedom, to establish the historical foundations for what they thought should be the next political step. They used dialectics, consciously or not, for ethics, to, so in order to derive from what has happened in the past and from what exists in the present to what ought to come next, what should be. Both wrote separately, unknown to each other, about the origins of civilization, about primal societies and the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, about the rise of agriculture and private property and class society, the rise of religion, of administration, states, armies, empires, monarchs, nobility, feudalism, and they both discussed modernity, the rise of the Enlightenment, science, technology, industrialism, capitalism. Just for convenience here for this speech, I'm going to call these accounts civilization narratives. Bookchin wrote two major civilization narratives. The first was the ecology of freedom in 1982, and the second was urbanization against cities in 1986. 
Ojolan wrote several, at least the ones I know are translated into English, The Roots of Civilization, and PKK and the Kurdish Question, and even the even more recent roadmap. They harnessed their civilization narratives to serve current political problematics. For example, Bookchin's Ecology of Freedom is, among other things, an argument against mainstream reformist environmentalism in favor of radical social ecology. Bookchin wanted to show these cautious liberals that they could aim for more than mere state reforms, that they could and should think in terms of achieving this decentralized ecological democratic society. People had lived communally in the past and they could do so again. So in the Ecology of Freedom, he highlighted the early preliterate societies in human history that he called organic society, tribal, communal, non-hierarchical, living in cooperation. The means of life were distributed according to customs of usufruct, or the use of resources as needed. Complementarity, ethical mutuality, and the irreducible minimum, the right of all to food, shelter, and clothing. From this feeling of unity between the individual and the community emerges, he wrote, a feeling of unity between community and the environment. In other words, these organic societies lived in harmony with the natural world. He then traced the dialectical development, the rise of hierarchy imminently out of organic society, patriarchy, the domination of women, gerontocracy, shamans and priests, warriors and chiefs, states, class society. Thereafter, the idea of dominating nature arose, reconceiving nature as an object to be exploited. Okay. For Murray, <coughs> excuse me, hierarchy's legacy of domination is countered by a longstanding legacy of freedom, resistance movements throughout history that have embodied principles from organic society, usufruct, complementarity, the irreducible minimum. The potential still remains for a dialectical transcendence of domination in a free cooperative society that could make possible a cooperative relationship with nature. Today, he called this set of ideas social ecology. <coughs> that was in 1982. Okay, in the second civilization narrative, urbanization without cities, he sought to establish the his historical, thank you, historical foundations for assembly democracy. And by the way, you may not realize it, but um, this book I'm about to discuss, Urbanization Without Cities, has been translated into German. It's out in the hallway at the Trotzdem Verlag table. It's called Die Agonie der Stadt. Die Agonie der Stadt, okay? I don't get any money for saying that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this book, he sought to establish the historical foundations for assembly democracy. As Eric explained, he found a tradition of a, a citizens' assemblies, especially in the ancient Athenian ecclesia, in early towns of e Italy and Germany and the Low Countries, in the Russian Vesh of Pskov and Novgorod, in the Comunero assemblies of 16th century Spain, in the assemblies of the revolutionary Parisian sections of 1793, in the committees, the grassroots committees and councils of the American Revolution, in the Parisian clubs of 1848, in the Par Paris Commune of 1871, in the Soviets of 1905 and 1917, in the collectives of revolutionary Spain in 1936 and 37 created by the anarchists, whose movement, by the way, he loved very dearly, and in the New England town meeting today among others. He showed how, contrary to Marxism, the venue for revolution was not the factory, but the municipality. So urbanization laid out the dialectical foundations for a municipalist revolt for freedom against the nation state. Meanwhile, confined to solitude in his island prison, Ojalan dedicated himself to study and writing, often these civilization narratives, Certainly one of his problematics in The Roots of Civilization, 2001, was to show the need for Turkey's democratic republic to include Kurds. He too described a process of social evolution, historical macro processes of civilization whose roots lay in Mesopotamia at Sumer. <clears throat> 
In his telling, at least in, as, from what I've read, from what's been translated into English, the ziggurat, a temple, an administrative center, and a production site, was the womb of state institutions. The topmost floor was said to be the home of the gods. The first floor was for the production and storage of goods. The temple thus functioned as a center of economic production. Rulers were elevated to divine status. The rest of the people had to toil in their service as workers in that temple-centered economy. The ziggurats, said Ojalan, were the laboratories for the encoding of human mindsets, the first asylums where the submissive creature was created. They were the first patriarchal households and the first brothels. The Sumerian priests who constructed them became the foremost architects of centralized political power, he wrote. Their temples grew into cities. Cities became states and empires and civilization. But the nature of the phenomenon remained the same. The history of civilization, he wrote, amounts to nothing else than the continuation of a Sumerian society grown in extension, branched out and diversified, but retaining the same basic configuration. In other words, we are still living in Sumer, still living in this incredible intellectual invention that, he wrote, has been controlling our entire history ever since. If Sumerian civilization is the thesis, he said, dialectically, then we need an antithesis, which we can find in, among other places, the Kurdish question. Ethnic resistance to the Sumerian city is as old as that city itself, he wrote. And today, a transcendence of the Sumerian state may be found in a fully de democratic republic, home to both Kurds and Turks. Now, now, I don't know very much about Ojalan's other intellectual influences, I admit that. The names Wallerstein, Braudel, and Foucault are, are mentioned often. But it's clear to me that in 2002, Ojalan in prison started reading Bookchin intensively, especially The Ecology of Freedom and Urbanization Without Cities. Thereafter, through his lawyers, I'm told, he began recommending urbanization without cities to mayors in Turkish Kurdistan and recommending the ecology of freedom to all the militants. In the spring of 2004, he had his lawyers write to Murray by email, which they did through an intermediary. And they explained to Murray that Mr. Ocalan considered himself to be his student, had acquired a good understanding of his work, and was eager to make the ideas applicable to Middle Eastern societies. He asked for a dialogue with Murray and sent one of his manuscripts. My friends, it would have been amazing had that dialogue taken place, but I'm sorry to tell you that um, at that age, Murray was 83 years old, he was sick, he was too sick to accept that invitation and reluctantly, respectfully declined. Ocalan's subsequent writings show the continued influence of his study of Bookchin. His 2004 work, In Defense of the People, which has been translated into German as Jenseits von Staat, Macht und Gewalt, um, is a civilization narrative that includes an account of primal communal social forms like Murray's organic society, which Ojalan named natural society. In natural society, Ojalan wrote, people lived as a part of nature, and human communities were part of the natural ecology. He presented an account of the rise of hierarchy that in many ways resembled Bookchin's. And more, moreover, the rise of hierarchy introduced the idea of dominating nature. Instead of being a part of nature, hierarchical society saw nature increasingly as a resource, he wrote. Ojalan even called attention to this process as dialectical nature. Natural society, he said, at the beginning of humankind forms the thesis contrasted by the antithesis of the subsequent hierarchic and state-based forms of society. Their respective civilization narratives have many points of overlap and difference. They would be fascinating to explore, but in the interests of brevity, I'll limit myself to one, the various ways in which they wrote about Mesopotamia. Ojalan, as I've said, emphasized that Mesopotamia was where civilization began. Bookchin certainly agreed, noting, in fact, that writing began there, 
quote, cuneiform writing had its origins in the meticulous records that the temple clerks kept of products received and products dispersed, unquote. He agreed that hierarchy priesthoods and states began at Sumer, although Murray also included ancient Meso Mesoamerican civilizations as well. But what seems to have been very compelling to him were, were the traces of resistance at Sumer. In Sumer, quote, the earliest city-states were managed by equalitarian assemblies which possessed freedom to an uncommon degree, unquote. After the rise of kingship, quote, there is evidence of popular revolts, possibly to restore the old dispensation or to dis diminish the authority of the king, unquote. Even the governing NC or military over overlords were repeatedly checked by popular assemblies. And it fascinated him clearly that it was at Sumer that the word freedom appeared for the first time in recorded history. It was the word amargi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Okay, amargi. In a Sumerian cuneiform tablet, it gives an account of a successful popular revolt against a regal tyranny in the name of amargi, freedom. Ojalan, after reading Bookchin, also noted the use of the word amargi, but otherwise didn't pick up on this point. But he did trace traits of Kurdish society to the Neolithic. Many characteristics of Kurdish society, he said, especially the mindset and material basis, bear resemblance to communities in the Neolithic. Even today, Kurdish society bears the cooperative features of organic society, he wrote. Throughout their whole history, Kurds have favored clan systems and tribal confederations that struggled to resist centralized governments. In other words, they are potentially bearers of freedom. As Marxists, Bookchin and Aj Ojalan had both been taught that the dialectical materialist processes of history are inexorable and function like laws with inevitable outcomes, like the rise of the nation state and capitalism. So says dialectical materialism. But in The Ecology of Freedom, ex-Marxist Bookchin was at pains to discredit such notions of social law and teleology. Not only had they, these ideas, these so-called laws, been used to achieve a, a ruthless subjugation of the individual to suprahuman forces beyond human control, as in Stalinist Russia, they denied the ability of human will and individual choice to shape the course of social events. In fact, he argued, even the rise of hierarchy was not inevitable. And if we put aside the idea that it was, that, that the rise of capitalism and the nation state were inevitable, then we may have a vision that significantly alters our image of a liberated future. That is, we live communally once, and we could live communally again. The buried memory of organic society functions unconsciously with an implicit commitment to freedom. I think that is the underlying liberatory insight of the ecology of freedom. Reading Ojalan's In Defense of People, I sensed in his words an exhilaration that reminded me of how I felt when I read The Ecology of Freedom back in 1985. I was delighted by the insight that people had once lived in communal solidarity and the potential remains and we could have it again if we chose to change our social arrange arrangements. The concept of the irreducible minimum seemed to me to just mean, mean socialism. Ecology of Freedom offers to readers what Murray used to call a principle of hope. It's following um, the philosopher Ernst Bloch, who wrote a book called Das Prinzip Hoffnung, The Principle of Hope. And that must have meant something to the imprisoned o Ojalan. The victory of capitalism was not simply fate, Ojalan wrote in 2004. There could have been a different development. To regard capitalism and the nation state as inevitable leaves history to those in power, he said. But rather, there was always only a certain probability for things to happen. There's always an option for freedom, he wrote. The communal aspects of natural society, he wrote, persist in ethnic groups, class movements, religious, philosophical groups that struggle for freedom. Natural society, he wrote, has never ceased to exist. A dialectical conflict conflict between freedom and domination has persisted throughout Western history, a constant battle between democratic elements who refer to communal structures and, whose, and those whose instruments are power and war. For the communal society is in permanent conflict with the hierarchic one. 
And finally, I was amazed to see <laughs> that Ojulam embraced social ecology. The issue of social ecology begins with civilization, he wrote in 2004, because the roots of civilization are where we find also the beginnings of the destruction of the natural environment. Natural society was, in a sense, ecological society. The same forces that destroy society from within also cut the meaningful link to nature. He wrote that capitalism is anti-ecological. Like Bookchin, <laughs> so amazing. Like Bookchin, he also argued for a specifically ethical revolt against it. He wrote, morality must be developed into a new social ethics that is in harmony with traditional values. And of course, the liberation of women is basic, crucial. He, called, he too called for a democratic ecological society, by which he meant a moral-based system that involves sustainable dialectical relations with nature, where common welfare is achieved by means of direct democracy. And it certainly applied to the Kurdish question. He emphasized that achieving Kurdish freedom means achieving freedom not just for Kurds, but for everyone. Any solution will have to include options not only valid for the Kurdish people, he wrote, but for all people. That is, I am approaching these problems He's, he said, based on humanism, on one humanity, one nature, and one universe. But now, instead of through the democratic republic, he said it was to be achieved through assembly democracy. In March of 2005, he issued his Declaration of Democratic Confederalism in Kurdistan, which called for grassroots democracy based on the democratic communal structure of natural society to establish villages village, town, and city assemblies, and their delegates will be entrusted with real decision-making, which in effect means that people and the community will decide." Unquote. And Ojalan's democratic confederalism preserves his brilliant move of linking the liberation of Kurds to the liberation of humanity. It affirms individual rights and freedom of expression for everyone, regardless of religious, ethnic, and class differences. It promotes an ecological model of society and, of course, women's liberation. He urged this program upon his people. I'm calling on all sectors of society, in particular women and the youth, to set up their own democratic organizations and to govern themselves. By 2004, 2005 then, Ocalan had either given up on or shifted focus from his effort to persuade the state to reform itself by democratizing from the top down. The idea of a democratization of the state, he wrote in 2005, is out of place. He had concluded that the state was a mechanism of oppression, the organizational form of the ruling class, and as such, one of the most dangerous phenomena in history. It's toxic, toxic to the democratic project, a disease, in fact, and while it is around, quote, we will not be able to create a democratic system. So Kurds and their sympathizers must never focus our efforts on the state or on becoming a state, because that would mean losing the democracy and playing into the hands of the capitalist system. Democratic confederalism, says his declaration, is a democratic system of the people without a state. Now, that seems pretty unequivocal, and certainly it's in accord with Bookchin's revolutionary project. Bookchin had posited, as Eirik explained, that once citizens' assemblies were created and confederated, they would become a dual power pitted against the nation state and overthrow and replace it. But Ojalan, in, the same, in this 2004 work in defense of the people, also sends a different message, quote, it is not true in my opinion that the state needs to be broken up and replaced by something else. It's illusionary for democracy, it's illusionary to reach for democracy by crushing the state. Rather, the state can and must become smaller, more limited in scope, he wrote, in order to make room for democracy. Some of its functions are necessary, for example, public security, social security, national defense, the confederal democracies' congresses should solve problems that the state cannot solve single-handedly, he wrote. So, while the state is, uh, so uh, when the state is limited, it can coexist with democracy in parallel, complementary to it. It seems a contradiction um, that, that bedeviled even Ojalan himself. The state remains a Janus-faced phenomenon, I found that he wrote. I sense that the issue remains ambiguous for him, but, but understandably so. Insightfully, he, he observed that our present time is an era of transition from state to democracy. In times of transition, the old and the new often exist side by side. And I must say that Bookchin's communalist movement 
never got anywhere near as far as the Kurdish movement has in practical terms. So, and if it had, it probably would have confronted the same dilemma. But one thing I could suggest here is that the concept of a traditional, of a, the, is the concept of a transitional program, which Bookchin would invoke in such occasions. He used to distinguish between the, uh, the minimum program, which is reforms on specific issues, the transitional program, like perhaps this one that Ojalan is offering, and the maximum program, socialism, a stateless assembly democracy. Minimum, transitional, maximal. That distinction, by the way, has a revolutionary pedigree. Murray used to credit it to Trotsky. It's a way to maintain a commitment to your long-term goals and principles while dealing in the real non-revolutionary world. So as I'm saying, Murray would have had to confront the same dilemma that Ojalan did eventually. In any case, in May 2004, when Bookchin heard from Ocalan, through the lawyers, he conveyed back a message. Quote, my hope is that the Kurdish people will one day be able to establish a free rational society that will allow their brilliance to once again flourish. They are fortunate indeed to have a leader, oops, excuse me. They are fortunate indeed to have a leader of Mr. Ocalan's talents to guide them. Unquote. We later learned that this message was read aloud at the Second General Assembly of the Kurdistan People's Congress in the summer of 2004. When Bookchin died in July of 2006, after he died, the PKK Assembly saluted one of the greatest social scientists of the 20th century. He introduced us to the thought of social ecology and helped to develop socialist theory in order for it to, to advance on a firmer basis. <laughs> how to make it a reality. He has proposed the concept of confederalism, a model which we believe is creative and realizable. The PKK assembly continued, Bookchin's thesis on the state, thank you, power and hierarchy will be implemented and realized through our struggle. We will put this promise into praxis, this as the first society that establishes a tangible democratic confederalism. My friends, no tribute could have made him happier. I only wish he could have heard it. Perhaps he would have saluted them back with that first recorded word for freedom from Sumer, Amargi. Thank you. Gosh.